All right. So welcome to Talking Data Equity for Friday, June 9th. And I am Heather Krauss. I am a mathematical statistician, and I am the founder of a project called We All Count, which is a project for equity in all things data. And one of my very favorite things that we here at We All Count and all of you do uh, together every, almost every single week is called Talking Data Equity. And that's what this is. Uh, this is an informal gathering that is live on Zoom and we hold it as a meeting. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we can have a troll-free meeting <laughs> pretty much every Friday. Um, and uh, we have a lot of new people joining us today because we have a very exciting topic and we have a lot of familiar friends and community members. So just to give you the idea, of what Talking Data Equity is. It is genuinely just a community gathering for anyone who's interested in the topic of data equity, anyone who is working to embed more equity in the data work that they are doing. And what we do each Friday varies a lot. Some Fridays we talk about something that is extremely um, specific and technical, like how to do a specific type of analysis. And sometimes we talk about something that's more conceptual, like how to think through um, a data collection project. And then lots of times we have special guests. And today we have a very, very special guest that I am extremely excited about. And that special guest is uh, Sarah J. Sanford. And you might, if you're a longtime attender of Talking Data Equity, you will already know Sarah J. <laughs> because uh, she is an epidemiologist and she works on some very, very cool projects in health equity and giving all kinds of different community folks access to useful and important data. And she is going to give us a review of some of that work and show us a really, really cool uh, new project that they have launched. She, she mentioned it last time she was here and said she would come back when they launched it. And uh, true to her word, here she is. So how this works in practice is that um, Sarah is Sarah J is going to talk to us for a little while and share some slides. And while they're doing that, we ask that you please remain on mute. Feel free to use the Zoom chat. Uh, feel free to use the Zoom chat and um, ask questions and make comments. Uh, but stay on mute until we get to the live question and answer period. And during the live question and answer period, then if you want to raise your hand and we'll take turns coming off of mute and having a discussion and a, a conversation, uh, that is what we have found works best when we're trying to have this many people on a Zoom meeting. <laughs> okay. So Having said all of that, um, we are, oh, the last thing I'm going to say to answer a question that's coming is uh, I just put a link in the chat. The link that I put in the chat is to the We All Count Data Equity Community Forum. Uh, that's a free uh, discussion forum that you can participate in at any time. Um, it's not a membership site. It doesn't uh, require any special type of admission. Anyone can read that form. And if you want to post a question anytime, any day, or look for a resource, all you need to do is um, sign up. And by sign up, I mean, put in an email and uh, assign yourself a password that we use for only one thing. And that one thing is to send you a reminder. If you forget your password, um, you are not signing up for marketing material. We do not track you across the internet or serve you ads or anything like that. And the reason I mentioned that forum is that that is where we put the recordings. So if you want to rewatch any session of Talking Data Equity, that is where to go. All right, you've heard enough from me. <laughs> Let me um, turn it over to Sarah J. Sarah J, we are so, so grateful that you are willing to spend another hour with us. And um, I will let you take it from here. 
Thank you, Heather. Um, and thank you so much for making space for me to present here today. It's always such um, so much fun to participate in these as an attendee. And I'm really honored to share our work um, a little bit more with you today. So uh, as Heather mentioned, I have some slides. Let me go ahead and get those on your screens. Um, and I'm going to be talking about my team's work on our data biographies. I'm going to talk really about some of the nitty gritty of how we've operationalized this because that's something that I often wonder about. Um, and I'll share some of our other data equity work as well. Um, so I am, as Heather mentioned, an epidemiologist. I work at Public Health Seattle and King County, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we dig in, I'd like to take a moment to recognize that I'm speaking to you today from the Coast Salish People's Territory. In King County, we are on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Snoqualmie, and Tulalip tribes as well as other Coast Salish communities. And we are fortunate enough to be home to a vibrant and diverse community of indigenous people from all over the world that call King County home today. Um, this acknowledgement is just one small step against the erasure of those people. Um, and it's a call to action. Hopefully you'll see a little bit more of those actions embedded in some of the data equity work that I'm going to share with you today. And then let me pause and introduce myself briefly. Um, there's some like resume type stuff here, but really what I want to share is that my path to being a data nerd was perhaps a little more circuitous um, than some folks. I actually was trained primarily in humanities in undergrad. I started working in uh, LGBT health nonprofit and thought, you know, there's got to be something more than making up what I do every day and decided to go get a master's in public health, um, which I did at the University of Washington in community oriented public health practice. Um, so my work really is grounded in practice and in community relationships. Um, I love working in public health practice. It's a little bit different than a more academic or research setting. And I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different areas across public health in the last um, almost 20 years, <laughs> including HIV prevention, immunization promotion, uh, maternal and child health, and more. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I also want to just say happy Pride Month to anyone out there who is celebrating today. It's my personal favorite holiday, and not only because it lasts all month, but because it's, it's a meaningful one for me. Um, now that I've introduced myself, I want to talk a little bit more about King County, Washington, because as a local health jurisdiction, um, we really focus on serving this community, understanding the health needs, strengths, um, yeah, and what's going on here. We are home to 2.3 million people. Um, so although we are just one county, uh, we are actually have a larger population than 15 U.S. states. Um, we've got about a third of the Washington state population. Um, we're actually geographically bigger than a couple states as well. Love you, Delaware and Rhode Island, but um, <laughs> we go all the way from the crest of the Cascade Mountains down to the shore of the Puget Sound. Our largest city is Seattle. We have about three quarters of a million residents and Seattle, while it has certainly a reputation of being very white for a major metropolitan area in the US, um, I think of our county here as very diverse. And in fact, one in four King County residents was born in a country outside the US and about 30% speak a language other than English at home. Um, so we are in many respects a very prosperous county. You'll see here that the median household income is over $100,000. That's pretty high. Um, but we're also a place where there's a really high cost of living. Um, and so even when we look at like the percent of folks living at two times the US federal poverty level, I still think of that as it's well below what is actually a living wage for most families. Um, so we have rising homelessness, and economic inequality in our communities as well. So in the health department, the unit that I work for, assessment, policy development, and evaluation, um, we are kind of the 
everything besides infectious disease epidemiologists at our county. Um, and so what that means is we work with data from lots of different sources. Some of these probably are very familiar to you. Some of them are more specific to our county, but we use data um, from surveys to administrative data, to you know, our beloved and classic vital statistics data like birth and death, to understand uh, the health, well-being, and status of you know what's going on in King County communities. And if this looks a little bit um, like a crazy quilt, that is intentional. Um, and again, as I'm sure is a familiar experience for many of you, this data comes to us in so many different formats. Um, and with so many different, you know, stories and uses. And so, as I mentioned, it comes to us from many data owners um, or data stewards. And so we are beholden to different ethical um, and data sharing agreements for all of these as well. And so we ourselves collect really a pretty small amount of the data that we use. Um, we do collect some of it, but a lot of it comes from other state and federal agencies that provide um, services like public housing or Medicaid or that work on a more population-based surveys like behavioral risk factor surveillance system or the American Community Survey. So we've got all this data that comes in its many, many beautiful and diverse forms, and it comes from so many different places. What do we do with all that in our quest to understand uh, health and well-being of King County communities. We create so many data products, most of which bring together data from lots of different sources to shed a fuller light on the issue that we are looking at. Um, and these range from some really more specific ones, this little uh, group of tiles that you might see in your bottom left-hand side of your corner is all about firearm violence, the impacts of gun violence in our county, um, whereas others are more broad. So like the community health needs assessment and community health indicators, we have um, what we internally lovingly call our data dump that has over 150 indicators by dozens of different demographic and geographic breakdowns. So there's a ton there and it's more of an exploratory resource than um, than a focus on a particular topic or something with a specific message to deliver. So we have all this data, we put it out in so many ways. Um, our goals is to always have both data democracy, sharing out the data that we have access to so that our partners, not just in county or other local governments, but in community can use that data towards their own needs and missions. Um, as well as data to action. We want it to be usable. We hope that our data inspires policy change, um, inspires resources to be directed to where they are most needed. Um, so we put it out there. We hope that folks use it. We have close relationships, of course, with you know, our own uh, county teams, as well as many community partners. And so you know, we get a lot of questions. Um, and because we pull together data from many sources, a common question, the one I've actually heard the most, is where does this data come from? And I believe that the question that underlies that question most often is, can I trust this data to accurately represent my community? Um, I think especially around language access, that's something that our county has gotten a little bit better about during the pandemic and since the pandemic. Um, but like that's a huge issue in the way a lot of this data is collected. So we get these questions a lot. I love these questions. Um, sometimes when people ask me about where this data comes from, I sense a shyness, like, I'm afraid you're not gonna like that I sound a little skeptical of the data that you're telling me. And I love getting that question because I'm like, that means you're engaging and critically thinking and I would love to, dig deep into the limitations and strengths of these data sources with you. Um, but we also wanted a more you know, transparent way that 
would be accessible, you know, to any interested person in our community um, to share a little bit more about what those strengths and limitations are. So when we did a training with Heather's team at We All Count, we learned about their um, wonderful, amazing idea for data biographies, which if you haven't explored this resource from them before, um, the way I think of a biography is that it tells the life story of a data source. And this can take many, many formats. So what I'm sharing today is just the way that our team has decided to implement it. Um, it can be a little more technical, but we really wanted to, you know, we've got tons of technical documentation. We really wanted to create something that, you know, somebody who's a student doing a project using our data could look at and get their questions answered clearly. We wanted something that an advocate who's uh, using data about their community to advocate for policy change could understand clearly what communities were represented there. So um, that's really been our goal with creating these data biographies. But as I will share, we actually found a lot of benefits that weren't necessarily what we had planned for or anticipated. So um, as many of these projects are, uh, this was not something that we created because we had funding or because we had somebody that was like, you know, I've got time to kill with something I could start working on. Um, it was a bit of a labor of love and we knew it'd be a lot of work. Um, so we kind of built it into our orientation process. When new staff join us, um, they are asked to work on a data biography. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to learn about a data source that they might be working more with, um, and also an opportunity to connect with the, our team that puts them out, as well as our internal subject matter experts who um, you know, can answer any questions that they have about the data and review the data biography. So we created our first batch with our six most commonly used data sources, and we have gone on to create more. So we've now got 10. Um, that we're pretty happy with for our kind of top 10 most commonly shared out data sources. We work together to create a template. So when folks are getting started, they're not starting from scratch, um, but they, they have some questions to answer. And we also worked really hard to create some shared language for common content. So as I mentioned, we use survey data and we're like, well, what's the right amount of detail or how can we clearly explain about survey weighting. Um, so those were really helpful generative conversations um, where we wanted to, you know, put that in there in a way that wouldn't overwhelm someone who might not be familiar with that, but also provide information um, if they wanted to learn more about, you know, what's survey weighting, why might you do that with your data. Um, so once they're drafted, as I mentioned, um, they're reviewed by one of our, our kind of like super user internally of that data source for accuracy, as well as our community's count team. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means um, for clarity and just consistency in language. So these are the questions that we set out to answer in each data biography. Um, who collects the data? Who owns the data? How is the data collected? Who is included and excluded from the data? Where is the data collected? Why is the data collected? How often? Um, this is a big one because in, in public health, often people would love, you know, people would love if I could share with them 2023 data right now. But for some of these data sources, I won't get that 2023 data from, for example, our State Department of Health until late 2024. And then again, it takes us time to, um, you know, actually do our own analysis on it. So there's quite a bit of lag, um, not always, but often, especially with things like vital statistics. Um, what else is important to know? Where can I learn more? And then we have a data privacy and security statement that we include in each one. So this is kind of a lot of questions, but we seek to answer these in a maximum of two pages. So you can download these as PDFs from our website. Um, and they're all just about two pages long at the most. So with, with this many questions, you can imagine that um, the answers are really pretty concise. Um, and I believe that plain language, jargon-free language is a constant aspiration 
Um, I won't say that we've achieved perfection in these data biographies, but it's it's our goal. Um, and so while there's always room to improve, that's something we've really prioritized in these resources. So uh, when we created these, we share them on a platform called Communities Count. Um, this is many communities count as many things, but it's also one thing it is is kind of a skin over some of the data that the health department has in a much more community friendly way. Um, with much love to my colleagues at King County Information Technology, you know, what I've heard from community partners is that it is not the easiest thing to navigate the county website and find the data. So communities count, um, it's a place for data, for health equity, and is you know, completely designed around that. It's not the platform for every single county program. Um, and it's intended to be much more accessible than some of those other resources that we have online where we have a little bit less control about how they are presented. So we also link to them in the data products where those data sources are used as well. So as I mentioned, um, our key goal with the data biographies is to provide information about our data sources to partners in a way that is clear, transparent, and accessible to somebody without much technical background. Um, I'm, I really also have a kind of, my side hope is that this sparks, you know, increasing engagement and in critical thinking and data literacy um, among our partners as well. Um, we found so many internal benefits though, that again, we're not why we set out on this journey of creating data biographies, but have been really helpful. So um, new colleagues got a chance to connect to data sources as well as to each other and other staff. Um, we've been pretty much mostly remote since 2020. So with new people coming in, it's been a little bit harder to make those like informal connections with people that aren't, you know, the ones you're spending all day working with. So it's actually been really nice to build some bridges there. We've learned about data sources that we've been using for years. Um, and I'll, I'll out myself for that. But one example is um, I was working on the data biography for our birth data. And I learned that actually each hospital system has its own way of gathering many of the variables that are included in that data set. So, um, you know, for things like, did you smoke during your pregnancy? The hospitals can choose, and many do pull that from medical records. Um, different ones could be self-reported. Uh, they can gather it really any way they want, and then it gets put into that birth data set. Um, and I think that was really important for me to know because you know, there's a big difference uh, when when patients represented in a data set might be allowed to self-report than um, just something pulled from their EMRs. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have found these benefits such that we've kept chugging along, creating more data biographies, but um, I still would love to know more about how they are being used. I would love if you have feedback um, or if you have checked them out to hear your thoughts. Some of them, as I mentioned, are for data sources that you're probably very familiar with. Like I can imagine a lot of folks might find our American Community Survey data biography helpful because I've spent lots of time um, on data.census.gov digging through their documentation to try to find answers to what I think are pretty straightforward questions that are just there in our data biography. Other data sources are much more specific to our county, um, like the Best Starts for Kids Health Survey is something uh, funded by just a local initiative to learn about families uh, with kiddos in elementary school and younger. Um, so that, you know, that's not data others have. Um, but, you know, we put it out there, we link to it, we share it, and we hope that it's useful. We don't always hear back from folks that use it. So that's a, a constant question in the back of my mind is I would love to hear more from folks who use these and either find like, you know, you said this was jargon free, but I don't understand any of it, maybe, or thank you so much, this answered my questions, or I'm a student and this helped with my project. I would love to learn more about that. Um, so that's the data biographies. I am going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit more about some of our other data equity work because 
of course, the data biographies are just one piece of how we hope to embed equity across all the work that we do. Um, and so I would, if you have questions about anything on this list, I would love to hear from you or chat about it during the question session. Um, but some, some projects we've been working on include participatory data interpretation. So I mentioned we have a health survey in our county about um, families with young children. And we have worked with communities to share back data specific to their communities and say, you know, what do you think this means? Does it accurately represent your experiences? Um, why do you think this data looks the way it does so that they have the power of narrative creation around data rather than us in the institution hoarding that power? Um, we're working right now on some community-led data collection and analysis. We heard that um, in that interpretation, many communities just don't really want to take a survey and their experiences are never going to be accurately represented in one set of questions that inherently cannot be culturally relevant to every person in our county who might respond to them. So we're moving that data collection into community as well. Um, we're also on you know, I think a constant um, effort to improve the way that we collect data about identity in surveys that we use. Often that that means we play a role of advocating to the data stewards um, when we don't have the power to make those changes ourselves. Um, but it's an important one and one we hear a lot about from community. I do a lot of work building capacity of our community partners to um, not just use our data, but create their own data. Um, we're working more on having multilingual data collection and dissemination. Um, I keep mentioning it because it's, it's the survey that we actually get to control, but the Best Arts for Kids Health survey has been done in up to seven languages over the last few years. Um, integrating qualitative and quantitative data so that the numbers are not divorced from their context and meaning. Um, and collecting and sharing data about local BIPOC communities' experiences of racism. That was another one where we found it really important to integrate the qualitative and quantitative data. So we weren't just saying, hey, this percent of families report experiencing discrimination, but rather um, giving communities the voice to say what, what that meant, what that looked like, what that means in their lives. So I'm gonna share a little bit about this new tool that Heather mentioned, our health equity timeline. Um, this is another project that was a labor of love, not one done with really any funding. Um, so we worked with four amazing students over the past two years to put this together. And I really wanna shout out to them, Wendy Castillo, Cassidy Chang, Kristen Hong, and Isis Garcia. Three of them have just graduated this week from the University of Washington um, and they're amazing. So if anybody is hiring, I would love to uh, recommend them to you. Um, but what they've put together in the health equity timeline is by no means an exhaustive history of our communities here, but we really wanted um, to provide context to the inequities that we see across so much of the data that we use. We see the same inequities from the birth data to the behavioral risk factor surveillance data to the death data. And without context, you know, it's possible for many folks looking at that data to interpret it in a way that pathologizes those communities, which is, you know, kind of the opposite of our perspective in public health. But if we don't say that in some way, we don't share this context, um, you know, we could really be doing a harm or a disservice to communities and just putting all those disparities out there without any, any details about where they've actually come from. So it's not exhaustive, but it is um, 80 different policies and events that have impacted health equity um, in our county. It's just a starting point, um, but we really tried hard, uh, as you see in this example, to not just show the negative impacts of, you know, things like colonization, white supremacy, redlining, but to also show how communities have worked together to improve their health equity as well so that it's um, you know really a strengths based understanding of our communities in King County. Um, and we created it with an open source tool, Timeline JS, and I'm going to show you a little bit of what it looks like. 
I'll say that I've lived in King County for 15 years. I've done a lot of reading and really community driven work and I thought I knew our community really well, but I learned so much um, that I hadn't known before uh, when I you know, worked with our students on this project. So you can click through here in chronological order. Each uh, event has a pretty short little blurb. Again, this is not an exhaustive resource, but just to give an idea of some of the things that have impacted health inequity. Um, one challenge that I was most nervous about when we set out on this project was like, how are we gonna make this actually visually engaging for users? And our students found some amazing historical images. So each, um, each event has a really cool image and they're not all maps, but that's I guess how people like to document things. Not so many photos from the uh, 16th century, <laughs> the next couple uh, centuries. And then what you see down here is we've, we've mapped out um, each item on the health pol or the health equity timeline um, to what social determinants of health that it most impacted. So if you're interested in like in education, I'm going to click over here and I see uh, 1975 UW students protest universities hiring practices. If I'm interested in healthcare access, I'm just picking like random events here, but in healthcare access, ooh, Reliance Hospital founded by the Japanese community in 1913. Um, so there's multiple ways to navigate the, uh, the health equity timeline, depending on what you're most interested in. And we've also um, put links to a lot of local resources as well that range from some of the community organizations, including some that gave input on this, um, to more academic resources. We have a cool labor history center at University of Washington um, so that folks can dig in more because we, we really don't want to, anybody to think that this is a comprehensive um, story of health equity in our, in our histories in King County. Um, but that's the health equity timeline. I think my last slide is just contact information. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And I think we have plenty of time for some discussion now. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah J. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I, I got the link to that um, health equity timeline this morning, and I frankly had a very hard time paying attention uh, in some of my meetings because I wanted to really dive into it. And one thing that um, I... I don't think you mentioned, maybe you did and I didn't hear it, but um, you can download that timeline as an Excel doc. And I've already found a way to upload it into Tableau and then actually use all of the work and attention to context that you folks have done to annotate you know, um, line charts of how housing insecurity changed over time or how different health outcomes changed over time. So the the amount of value in this public resource is shockingly amazing. <laughs> like, thank you so much for, um, as you said at the beginning, um, using your copious amounts of free time <laughs> and millions and millions of extra dollars laying around um, to do this. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of links to the timeline in the chat, but um, uh, yeah, great. Hopefully you can find it. Okay. So, um, are there, there's a couple of questions coming into the chat, but before we go to the questions in the chat, um, are there folks in the room that want to raise their hand and, um, unmute yourself and ask a question live? Go ahead, Leslie. Hi. Hi. Hey, Heather. Um, hi, Sarah. That was an amazing presentation and what amazing work you guys are doing. Um, what is the plan for the timeline to keep it going in the future? Or is there one? And and then how did how are decisions made about what gets added? That is a really great question. Um, as I mentioned, our students worked on this for two years. So we actually 
already put our first round of additions in there before we launched it. Um, our most recent events include some of the uh, Black Lives Matter activism that happened, uh, is still happening, but that was big news in Seattle in 2020. Um, and our city also became the first jurisdiction to uh, pass um, a law against caste-based discrimination. So those are our most recent things and were added um, most recently. We really would love, um, well, we have no plans to make this an exhaustive resource and we tried really hard to have lots of different communities represented, um, many different racial, ethnic, national communities, but also um, LGBT communities, the Jewish community, um, so we have invited folks if they have, you know, comments, especially about like how their community is represented to share that with us. Um, we don't really have a process for deciding what goes in, but we do uh, have amazing documentation that again, our wonderful students worked on as part of their process. It's actually, I, I don't wanna, it, it's not, it's kind of low tech. It's all based on that spreadsheet that Heather downloaded. Um, so as we continue working with students, we will be able to add things like pretty easily. That's part of why we selected this tool. Um, it's, you know, it's not perfect. We've gotten some user feedback that that little bar along the bottom, back up, you know, where, where you see this language, like it's like light gray on light gray. We can't really change that, but it's an amazing tool because, you know, it's free to us to use it. It has all the basic functionalities we wanted and we're gonna be able to keep it up to date pretty easily. Um, so as far as how we'll figure out what gets added, we're gonna to have to kind of see what kind of suggestions and feedback we get and develop that process going forward. That sounds so great. Thank you very much. It, it is very, very cool. And um, I think that one of the things that is almost inevitably going to happen is once you have a proof of concept like this, that's what it takes somebody to be willing to kind of in exactly the way that you did not have a lot of time and funding, but make a proof of concept um, that plants the seed that allows um, this to, to become sustainable because enough people will see it. And I'm just going to quickly, before we get to the other questions, quickly circle back to what you mentioned about how you weren't sure if other people were using your data biographies. Mm -hmm. you, you were talking, so you probably didn't see it go by in the chat, but a number of people said, yes, we use your data biographies. And I know for sure in the coaching and consulting that we do, uh, people in all levels of government and academia and research use your data biographies. So we'll figure out a way to help you collect that so that we can keep the funding ball rolling. I'm gonna pause for a second and just ask a couple of technical questions and then I'm then we'll go to Mish. Um, is it correct that the tool that you use to make this is called Timeline JS? Yes. Um, and if you forget that, you can see it right here um, right. and click through to learn more about that resource. Right. And so JS will stand for JavaScript, which means that um, it's going to be a nice tool that's going to automate a lot of the dynamic parts of this so that um, Sarah J doesn't have to have a, a large software development team working uh, for them. And that is probably why somebody mentioned, asked a question about screen reader friendly. It's probably not screen reader friendly right now, or is it? Oh, it, it is. is. Yes. Wow. That was actually oh my gosh. A question we got in, uh, you know, we did kind of like an initial round of sharing this before we like launched it. And uh -huh. so one of our students, Kristen Hong did wow. a test and it actually is screen reader friendly, which um, I was, I, I kind of assumed as you did Heather, that that would be like something going on on our to-do list, but. Right. That is just, it just gets better and better. <laughs> that is so, so cool. Thanks for waiting, Mish. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Hello. No worries. Um, first, I want to say I think it's an amazing tool as well. And I was looking at it while people were talking and I heard the question and I think what I what's valuable about this tool is there are communities who do 
work but don't necessarily know how to capture it in a way that bridges with government or uh, you know, even grant writing. And so um, while I was looking at it, I was thinking, oh, wow, I have something that I use when I'm researching that I kind of tabulate uh, all of my um, research that I'm doing in it, but this would be an excellent way um, if folks are using it, just if you offer it or just send the link because you can't always have students and know about it who are using it. Um, and then if it could be uploaded into something similar to what uh, Heather created for, um, just native tribes and lands. Uh, you can go into Tableau and map it. She kind of pulled data because then you could see what communities, and that's what I like about mm -hmm. this. It's communities that are there. And it's not saying there aren't other communities there because you can't, you can't capture everything. But it's so simple that if folks turned it in and there was a way to like upload it somewhere, it would allow us to see um, equity through a completely different lens because we would have an idea of what people felt was important or strength-based for their own community to include and we wouldn't be deciding it. So I'm gonna actually be playing around with it and sharing it with my um, small research group after I um, tweak it to kind of do what I want it to do with the research. And I'm very excited. I think it's a really wonderful project and a product. And I just wanted to tell you that um, I appreciate its simplicity and its complexity combined together. Thank you so much um, for your kind words. I guess that sparks a couple thoughts for me. One is that, um, you know, right now it's like, we have our data, we have the health equity timeline and really bringing those two things together um, would be a bit of a dream because, you know, they are so deeply connected and can't really be understood without each other. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is that we um, we really wanted this to feel to be local in King County. So there are right. things that you will see on here that impacted you know the entire continent, like colonization in different ways. But so we did include those things that that didn't happen only at a local level. But we also did include a lot of things that happen locally. Um, and I think part of why that was so important to me, it's not just because it's like, well, we're sharing data about King County, so we should have a timeline about King County. But, you know, I grew up in DC, Maryland and Virginia. Um, so depending on who you ask, maybe kind of the South, not really the South. Uh, I call it the Mid-Atlantic. But when I moved to Seattle, um, I, I I felt an attitude from many that racism or like slavery happened in the South. Like what's the problem here? And I think it's really, really important to understand our local histories around that and um, move against that narrative. So, um, so yeah, so, and I learned so much again, not just about like some of the horrible things that have happened, like there was, there were riots in Seattle to try to expel Chinese immigrants, um, but also some amazing things in our history, like uh, the example that was on the slide about Filipino American counter unionism that has been kind of like a stalwart of the whole labor movement in the Northwest um, and just really some incredible, incredible histories of our communities, as well as some of the harms that have been perpetrated. I Thank really, really that. love that point. Oh, sorry, Mish, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that and I appreciate the response. And I think if, if anybody embarks on something similar, like I just, I have appreciated learning so much and you will learn so much about your own, you know, state, city, whatever you're looking at that will be unique and different from what's in this timeline. Yeah, the local aspect. Thank you for emphasizing that local aspect. I think it's so important to, to remember how important local context is to equity. Becky, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing resource. Uh, I'm so grateful to have learned about today. And I, I just had a couple of 
questions. Um, one was the primary audience that you have in mind for who is um, who you see or intend to be accessing this um, this resource. Um, and I was also just wondering from a capacity standpoint, how, how long did it take to create what you have at this point built and how big was your kind of team and like the, the resources that were dedicated towards getting to the point you are right now with, um, with, the, with the timeline? Um, those are both great questions. Um, I'll start with the second one. So as I mentioned, we worked with four students um, and over two school years, we had two students working um, each school year. So in the first six-ish months of the project that we worked with two of them, one of them was working eight hours a week, mostly solely on this project. Um, one was also spending a few hours a week. And in that time we got like most of the content hashed out, but then it took us with our next two students the whole next school year to polish everything, sort out some of the behind the scenes technical um, issues, which were not about timeline JS, they were about King County. Um, and really go through, make sure everything's like well cited, find all of these beautiful images that are included in the timeline. Um, but as far as our, like, you know, our, our non-work study students, our staff time, it wasn't a huge amount. Um, my colleague Marco Toyoji and I spent, you know, like an hour or two a week. Um, supporting our students first in conceptualizing this and figuring out like what should we include, how should it be organized, what tools should we use, um, and then just you know giving them some guidance and project management as they they really did the work of creating it. Um, so I hope that answers your question about capacity. Um, as far as the audience goes, you know it's interesting because I. Think of Communities Count as a platform that really is dedicated to our community partners. Um, but when I think about the timeline and our community partners, you know, my hope, I don't think that they need to learn about this history from us at King County. My hope is more that they see their community, you know, respectfully represented here. Um, I've actually gotten some really positive uh, feedback and comments from some of our more institutional partners. And you know, I, I would love for more folks, not just in King County, but our other local governments and other institutions that do hold that power to be um, more mindful of this history. So, um, you know, I would love if it's useful to community members, but again, I think, you know, they are the ones who've shared this with us. It's, it's right. not, you know, they don't need to hear it from us, they know it. It's mm -hmm. more institutional partners that need to be hearing it sometimes, I think. I'm gonna ask a follow-up question on, on the topic of uh, institutional partners and kind of getting people or organizations in positions of power that's mm -hmm. kind of like an active conversation in the chat is, do you have any um, tips or conversations about how to convince people who you know who are in charge of budgets who are in charge mm -hmm. of resources who are in a position of power that things like this really matter what was the pitch that worked that is a great question i will say that while um we have lots of work to do i am very grateful to be in a jurisdiction that has um explicitly held equity and social justice as a value for a long time. Um, that's not to say that the county doesn't still perpetrate inequities, but we've had like at our county level, because I work for the county government and ESJ ordinance since I wanna say maybe 2011, it's actually probably in the timeline <laughs> if I wanted mm -hmm. to look that up. <laughs> so, um, you know, the fact that it's aligned with the stated priorities helps. I think, um, you know, it's complicated, the relationship between having a stated value and then living that value. But at least the fact that we had that stated value um, 
you know, makes it easy to say, hey, we could actually do Mm -hmm. something in alignment with this. Um, And then the fact that it really was kind of low, low tech um, meant that we didn't have to advocate very hard for resources. Um, Those students that we work with, you know, they also do a lot of like the nuts and bolts of maintaining the website. Um, So, you know, they're not like solely dedicated to this. We didn't have to say, let's bring on a student just to do this. Um, Mm -hmm. They they're folks that we would have had the privilege to connect with. And because they do a lot of that nuts and bolts stuff, you know, we always want to have something that's more of a professional development, learning opportunity, skill building project for them. Um, So that's what this was, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it definitely was. And uh, I just want to highlight one of the things that you said to answer one of the questions about how to convince people in power to give you the time or money or whatever your job description requires. This is a really good time to look at what kind of equity statements your organization or your funder uh, made in the last two years and, and, you know, use the statements, use the public facing um, statements or strategic dedications to equity to say, you know, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, we have found that that's a very, very effective way to um, approach and ask for resources. <laughs> okay, I believe it is five to one. So we will leave it here for today because we try very hard to give you five minutes <laughs> so that you're not continuing this back to back Zoom culture so everybody can be a little human and have five minutes to breathe. So as I mentioned, we will put this recording and links to all the resources in our data equity community forum so that you can uh, play around with it and use it in your work, use it to try and convince your organization to do similar things. Uh, And it continues to be really, really, really amazing and important how many of you show up, what thoughtful, insightful questions you have, and all the connections and the additional resources that are shared in the chat. I know people use them and refer to them all the time. So the value that each of you bring to this community is amazing. And thank you for coming today. Um, next Friday, we will, we will be meeting again and we'll be doing something a tiny bit different next Friday. Uh, we have a regular attendee at talking data equity named Artrice Morrison, who is, um, doing a very interesting kind of health equity, trying to design a health equity survey, uh, for their work. And we're going to do a little bit of live workshopping (laughs) on that survey, uh, next Friday. So we're, we're going to do something a little bit different, um, where we're actually going to try and practice, um, making some data equity decisions in the design of a survey together, uh, next Friday. So we're really looking forward to that and, um, have a fabulous rest of your day. Take good care of yourselves and good care of each other. And we will see you later. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sarah J. We really, really appreciate both you coming today and the amazing work that you are facilitating in your team. Sector changing. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you all this morning. Okay. Bye everybody.